The CSI effect has changed the way juries see cases, and as a result, it's changed the way lawyers present evidence at trial. How long does it take to get a DNA test back from the labs? Do we have a plan to deal with the backlog of rape kits? And does reliability have to do with the science or with the lab? Good evening and welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name's Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HCCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight, we're gonna to talk about the Houston Forensic Science Center with our special guest, Dr. Scott Hotchberg and lab technician, Robin Guidry, with our host, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us this evening. We are welcome to have Scott Hotchberg and Robin Guidry of the Houston Forensic Science Center. As Carmen said, uh, we will be taking your phone calls later this evening. You can call us at 713-807-1794. We'll also be taking your questions via Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. So please join us on the conversation there. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, HCCLA Reasonable Doubt on Facebook.com. I want to bring in my co-host tonight, Damon Parrish. How are you this evening? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. We've got a few news items I think we need to touch on. We had the election this week. Yes. Uh, the Democrats kind of got waylaid, didn't they? And it was to be expected. <laughs> it, was to be, it was Texas for one, but yeah, uh, everyone Republican ran who won. That's, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, Devin Anderson locally won, which also was to be expected, so yeah. We'll see what comes out of that. Hopefully we'll get some clarity on the new marijuana policy and, and some other policies that I think D.A. Anderson intends on introducing in the next in the next year. I want to get to a couple other cases, hot cases, Damon, that came out this week. We had, obviously, the resolution of the Adrian Peterson matter, which we talked about earlier this year um, as that case was progressing. Mm -hmm. Earlier this week, Peterson appeared in before State District Judge Kelly Case in Montgomery County and entered his plea, uh, actually a plea to no contest. What happened there? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Peterson uh, pled to a misdemeanor assault case. So his felony case was reduced to a Class A misdemeanor. Uh, he received 80 hours community service and a $4,000 fine. Uh, no jail time, and uh, that's it. Damon, there was a lot of talk that I heard amongst people that said Peterson was getting fair treatment, this, the, the quick trial date. Then he gets this kind of a plea deal, and I guess something that came out today was that Judge Case had sealed the records. Um, the DA had come out and said this was very unusual, that they had never seen anything like that. In your opinion, do you think Adrian Peterson got special treatment uh, as opposed to somebody else, a regular citizen? Uh, in my opinion, he did not. I mean, now, he got media treatment. Obviously, the cameras are there while he's there, but he was a first-time first -time, uh, defendant, so there's always a little leeway there. And the case just seemed kind of weak. And I don't know much about the case. I don't know much about it at all. But it didn't seem like the kind of case where I thought they were reasonably going to go the distance on it. So uh, everybody kind of won. Everybody's safe faced. He didn't formally say he was guilty. He still has an NFL career. Uh, DA Brent Ligon did back down. The case wasn't dismissed. And Rusty Harden got a third degree reduced to a Class A. So everybody won. I mean, it, uh, that's just kind of what I thought was going to happen. And now I guess we'll just see what the NFL does and whether they reinstate him quickly or make him wait out or, you know, yeah. punish him in addition to what he's already served out. I'm sure he'll get it reinstated eventually. Maybe not this year, though, but I'm sure he'll get it reinstated eventually. The last case I want to talk about before we get to our guest this evening, Damon, um, big news locally here in Harris County, Constable Victor Trevino of Precinct 6 was set to go to trial on Monday. Uh, instead, he entered a plea of, of guilty uh, before Judge, State District Judge Susan Brown in the 185th. Uh, tell me what you know about that case. Well, first, it's, it's, a, it's a really sad case, and it's sad to have uh, Mr. Constable Trevino's career of 26 years be marred by a, a few bad choices. Uh, but he was basically charged with misapplication of fiduciary property, meaning he put his hand in his own monetary cookie jar. Um, he used his charity funds to 
fun trips to Vegas with his wife and, and other such things that probably weren't allowed. Um, well, actually, definitely weren't allowed. Uh, he went to trial, and after they picked the jury, after Vore Dyer, and they picked the jury, and they went through that process, he decided to enter a plea uh, to what's called, we call a PSI, meaning he's going to go before Judge Brown later, and she's going to ultimately punish him and, and, and parcel out his fate. What do you expect? Honestly, I, I think, in my opinion, he deserves deferred. I mean, this case is a case that, de that deserves deferred adjudication. Why is that? Some people will say he's a constable, he took advantage of people's trust with this. I mean, why, why does he deserve a deferred? There, there's going to be people, and I'm sure there's already people on, for instance, the comments in the Chronicle, they're going to be calling for his head, and if he gets a sentence like that, that it'll be a light sentence. Why, why do you think he deserves something like that? Jimmy, I'm an, I'm an advocate for everyone being treated fairly. And he is a constable, but he's still a man. And he made a mistake, and he's paying for it. I mean, 26, a 26 year career marred and over. He's no longer comfortable, um, and everything he's done, he will be remembered for this conviction. I think that's pretty heavy. And this type of case, there was no violence. You know, he didn't steal from the government. Uh, no one was injured. It really was just his own acts that kind of put him in this situation. This is a deferred case. This is not a case that, that demands blood. This is a case that demands deferral, uh, deferred, and that's what he should get. And I'd be surprised if Judge Brown does not give him deferred. Thanks, Damon. Constable Trevino's sentencing will take place November 17th in front of State District Court Judge Susan Brown. We'll follow that and hopefully have an update for you in the, next, in the coming weeks on this show. And as always, we'll follow the latest cases and trends that are going on around the country and the Houston area with criminal topics here for you all to follow. I want to get to our guests this evening. As Carmen mentioned, we have two very special guests. We have Scott Hotchberg, who's the chairman of the board of the Houston Forensic Science Center, along with Robin Guidry, who's a, DA, a DNA technical leader within uh, the center. And some of you may know it by its former name, the HPD Crime Lab. So I want to bring in Scott, Robin, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out because, as I said, everybody probably knows you guys better as the HPD Crime Lab, for better or for worse. But this really is a new day, isn't it? It really is, and um, uh, we're glad to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. This is an exciting change, and Houston is um, breaking new ground in the operation of a forensic center. This is the first time that a major forensic center in the United States is being led by a citizen board, uh, has been removed from the auspices of law enforcement directly, um, has been, as I like to say, extracted from the Houston Police Department, set up under a corporate board, a nonprofit corporation sponsored by the city. Uh, I have the honor of chairing that board, but we have a, a strong board of nine citizen leaders. Um, and the objective is to make, to, to make it clear that this is a scientific organization, that we're about figuring out what the evidence is telling us, no more, no less, um, and that we serve all sides in the criminal justice system. And, and that's new. That's groundbreaking. Now, one of the interesting things, Scott, that I find about the, the Forensic Center is it really is a whole new organization. It, it is not under the auspices of HPD anymore. It has been taken out from under the police department and basically been created a, a, a new governmental corporation, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. We are, we are what's called a local government corporation. Um, it is essentially a nonprofit organization that's uh, uh, created by the city to carry out city functions. Uh, Houston First, that runs the convention center and the hotel, is also a, a local government corporation, the Houston Zoo. So, so these, uh, these enterprises that have good reason to have a, a separate board, and in our case, we were set up with a board that's appointed by the mayor with the, uh, with the consent of city council, but we can't be removed during our terms except for, for uh, malfeasance or something like that. Again, to establish um, essentially a firewall in as many different directions as we can. And this really came out of a national study on the entire forensics world um, done by the National Academy of Sciences, and one of the strong recommendations they made was that forensic centers be independent of either police district attorneys, or for that matter, the public defender or defense organizations, um, were to stand alone. And that's not to imply that there was ever any particular bias that came out of being part of the police department, but uh, study after study has shown that even if you're not conscious of it, there is some likelihood that it's the surroundings that you deal in, it's the, it's the sandbox that you play in. 
Um, and more importantly than that even is the perception that the lab has some kind of a bias because it's part of a police department, it's part of law enforcement. So we're doing away with that in Houston, and it's, it's an exciting project to be a part of. Well, Scott, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> now that the lab has its independence, it's no longer under the umbrella of HPD, how does that impact your ability to be more transparent in your testing and your procedures and your successes and failures? How does that, how does that in any way, shape, form help you and help the community understand better about what the lab does? Well, it, um, it, it, under HPD, the lab uh, had made significant strides toward transparency. I think when we came aboard as a, as a new board to run this operation, the uh, standard operating procedures of the lab were already being posted on the HPD website. Um, it was open and available, but as a governmental uh, corporation, as a governmental nonprofit corporation, we're subject to the open meetings laws. So all of the actions of our board are done in public. We meet once a month uh, in the City Hall Annex. The meetings are open. They're on video. Uh, we take public comment. Um, uh, we're subject to Open Records Act. And so we've sort of decided to use that as one of our strengths and to make it clear that, that we're open for business for the people of the, of the City of Houston. Um, and that they own this lab, and we're going to be as open as we can within the, within the constraints of what we have to do to maintain confidentiality of, of cases, of course. But um, uh, we've been working to expand the website, to put more information out there, to make it so that, that you, uh, that defendants, um, don't have to, to, to ask for information that really should be public information and is public information. Scott, I think everybody's familiar with the, the history of the HPD crime lab. I mean, you had lying, you had improper procedures, you had tampering with official records, and this is just some of the things that the, that the media reported on that, that got some real bad public uh, play and, and really caused, I guess, a black eye, for lack of a better term right now, uh, upon not just the city, but upon, upon forensics in general. And so uh, I think what everybody wants to know is okay, we've moved everything out, but what steps have you put in place as chairman of the board and, and with the management team that's in place? What steps have you guys created to prevent things like that from happening in the future? Well, I think first of all, we, we need to, to talk about where the lab was when we took it over because uh, HPD has done a tremendous amount of work to make this into a first class operation. Uh, one of the, as, as you know, when the, um, when the problems with the lab were unveiled, I guess, in the mid-2000s, uh, Mayor White at the time uh, brought in an outside investigator, an independent investigator. They spent uh, a long time here, came up with a report that ultimately had about 150 recommendations in it. Uh, some of those were for the property room, which is not part of the crime lab, but uh, about 100 were for the crime lab. Um, and so the first thing we wanted to know is, what were we getting? Uh, as we come on as a new board. So we brought that same investigator back. This was an action taken by the board. We hired him to come back, not to do a full new investigation, but to simply go down the list of recommendations that had been made to, H to HPD and find out which of those were still outstanding and how many were still outstanding. As it turned out, about 90% of the recommendations had been carried out or were no longer relevant because of other changes in the operation. Uh, most of what he found had not been done were expansions into new areas of evidence, like trace evidence and question documents. And frankly, if I were HPD, I would have made the decision to, to clean up what was there before going into new areas. So that would have been the lowest on my priority list as well. Um, and so we plan to, A, uh, have uh, uh, continued audits uh, as necessary. Uh, the board looks very carefully at quality control reports that come out every month. We've made that a part of our regular board procedure. And, and any corrective action uh, proposal that goes into place, we look at, we review. All of that information comes to us. And again, all of that information is made public for you to see and everybody else. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's a different um, attitude that emerges that starts with the management team that we've put in place. We hired, uh, as a CEO, um, Dr. Dan Garner, who's, who came out of retirement after spending an entire career doing forensic work, both in the private sector, the public sector, um, and who came to this job 
because he believed that an independent forensic lab time had come and he wanted to be a part of it. Who, and who is who is Dan Garner? Like where where'd you hire from? Why did you choose him as the CEO or leader of a uh, of our new lab? You know, the 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 first job we had was to hire a CEO. And as a citizen board, it took us a while to figure out what we were looking for. And we sort of made a list of what we were looking for. We wanted somebody with, sci ideally, we wanted somebody with scientific experience. We wanted somebody who had run a lab in the private sector where uh, efficiency was important as well as accuracy. We wanted somebody who had led a, a management team building a lab. Uh, we wanted someone who knew how to, to, to lead people through change. All of those are huge challenges, and we sort of decided, gee, if we could get a few of those, we could bring in a number two guy uh, to, to do the rest. Well, as it turned out, Dr. Garner had all of those qualifications, and so it was a pretty easy choice for us once he made himself available um, uh, to, to, to bring him in and to put him in charge of this operation. And he's been building out his management team. Uh, one of the first things he did, and, and looking at again at the recommendations from Mr. Bromwich, was uh, to, to start expanding and raise to top level management uh, the quality control section. We always had people responsible for quality control. That's now been elevated to a top level position, and we're adding people in the individual areas of expertise. And, one of the things that, that Robin may be able to talk to you about is, is all the different areas in the lab, because it's not just DNA. The Forensic Center is, is, uh, uh, has, has eight or nine different areas of various types of forensic work. Each one of those will have its own quality control leader, and their job will be to, to oversee and make sure that everything is coming up to standards. The other thing that we're doing, and, and I'll, I'll try to make this brief, but um, accreditation. Uh, was not always something that labs and, and forensic centers were required to have. Our lab has recently achieved um, the highest level of accreditation available for labs, but other divisions within the forensic center have not yet been accredited. Uh, we are on a, uh, a time schedule to get every unit where accreditation is offered uh, accredited over the next 18 months. Uh, and again, this is something the board gets a report on every month as to where we're ahead of schedule, where we're behind schedule. So it won't be one of these situations where you get to the end of the 18 months and someone says, well, we didn't make it. We're going to know that and we're going we're gonna to try to meet those goals. And in fact, we've even talked about uh, ISO accreditation for the management team so that we make sure that all through the organization there's this, this attitude of, of top level of quality. Excellent. I want to bring in Robin Gidry. Robin. You're a DNA technical leader within the lab. Uh, I guess the best way to describe you, you're a carryover. You, you were at the HPD crime lab. You were an employee there before it became the Houston Forensic Science Center, right? That is correct, yes. And how long were you there? I've been with the city for about six years now. Okay, and have, have you always been in the DNA section or kind of, what, what, where have you been, what, what path got you here, and where have you been within the HPD crime lab and now the Forensic Science Center? Well, I've always been with forensic biology. Um, like I said, six years with the city of Houston. Um, before that, I spent about seven years in the private sector. And right out of college, I was with the New Orleans Police Department crime lab. So I've always done forensics, always biology, um, a little bit of private, a little bit of public sector. And I guess I want to ask you, Robin, because you guys are still in the HPD building. Um, the, the push is for transparency and for independence. And you're reporting now to a citizen like Scott uh, and, and, and his board who are made up of private citizens. Do you in any way feel like a, a little bit of a weight has been lifted off your shoulder that, that you get a report to uh, a, a private citizen as opposed to reporting to a police officer? Yes, I think we're all really excited about this transition. Just the, the concept of, of promoting that um, independence and, and removing any perception of, of bias that may have been there. Um, it, we, there was no bias. I mean, we, we, the laboratory was um, not accessible by police officers. Um, they didn't tell us how to do our testing. But it is nice that my boss now reports, instead of to the chief of police, to this board of directors. And one of the things 
that I guess, you know, us as defense lawyers, we come across, I mean, obviously we come and we, we make requests from you all to get access to the records through the court system, through the DAs. Uh, and, and one of the things we come across is having a real frustration of when things get tested. Can, can you enlighten us as to what the protocols are going forward with testing <coughs> DNA things, uh, DNA cases and kits and everything else? And I know, I know one of your things that we'll get into is the sexual assault kits, but, but kind of give our audience a, a flavor of what the protocols are in place for testing. Sure. Well, with the exception of sexual assault kits, um, most of our testing is request driven by the investigators. So, you know, we don't own the evidence. The evidence is stored in the property room, uh, like uh, Scott mentioned. And so when a request is made by an investigator, we will retrieve that evidence and perform testing. Uh, we sometimes receive requests from the uh, assistant district attorneys as well. Um, with the sexual assault kits, however, um, mostly because of recent legislation, a request for testing is automatically generated when a kit is collected and submitted to the property room. So because of that sample type, our system will automatically create a request and that will ensure that every kit gets tested and there's not um, a section or, or, or a subset of them that just remain untested. Now, I know for myself and some other lawyers what has happened in the past, and I guess some of our concern is that things don't get tested until cases are actually set for trial and we, quote, have a live trial date. Uh, that's, that's been some of the standard lines that I know myself and some other defense attorneys have been given with regard to DNA testing. Mm -hmm. Are we safe to assume that now we can expect that regardless of whether we have a live trial date or not, that the DNA in cases is going, going to get tested? Um, well, I wouldn't say everything is going to be tested. Um, like I said, we receive requests. It's request-driven with the exception of sexual assault kits. But we don't always know the facts of the case. In fact, we don't have information about the case to decide what should be tested. And so it is often through the investigators or the district attorney's office that requests are made. Um, we also receive requests from defense attorneys through the district attorney's office. And Robin, I have a question for you, and it's, it's a little more specific. Just on the, for a layman's term, when you go to work in the morning and you work there, what is your day like? You get to work, I mean, do you put on a white lab coat? Are you surrounded by real nice, fancy uh, machinery, you know, st uh, scopes and, and cool gadgets? Or is it, is it much simpler, like they're just beakers with little flames and, and bunts and burners? So what, what is a day like for you, an average technician in the new lab? The, the technicians do gown up. They wear face masks and lab coats and gloves. Uh, we very much concern ourselves with contamination. That's, a, that's an issue with DNA testing. It exists, and so we do a lot to prevent it. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, in terms of the equipment, we do have some, you know, we have microscopes, right? I mean, those, are, those have been around for a very long time, but still very useful in forensic testing. But we also have extremely um, high-tech um, equipment that we also get to get, that, that we use on DNA testing. So, uh, kind of, I, I understand what a DNA test is, but I do not understand how it works. And I don't know what you test for, what you look for. I know how you get it, and then you take a buccal swab out of my cheek, I give it to you, and then I come back later with a sheet of paper that says it's a hit or a miss. So from your side, once you get the buccal swab, kind of how do you do a DNA test? And, and when you're done with it, what do you do with the results? Sure. Well, the purpose of DNA is to help determine if the source of an unknown sample originated from a known source. In other words, uh, a sample from a crime scene, I can compare it to your DNA and determine did you contribute, could you have contributed this or not. Um, if the information doesn't match, I can tell it wasn't you. Uh, if it does match, I would then do statistical analysis to give significance or, or meaning to that match. But the process is um, very basically we want to extract the DNA sample. So that, that buccal swab you referenced, my goal is to first get those cells off of that swab, break them open, and capture all the DNA that's in there. All of our cells, with the exception of red blood cells, have DNA, and they have the same information. And, and because of that, I can compare blood to semen or saliva. I don't have to have the same cell type. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to access that DNA, and then I'm going to amplify it. I'm going to make millions and millions of copies. And this technology has enabled us to test samples that are not even visible to the naked eye. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, you needed a, a, a blood stain the size of a quarter. Um, now, because of this technology, um, we can start with very, very small amounts of sample and still yield the information we need for a comparison.
So like a hair from, like an eyebrow hair, like that, is, that, is that true? Like you, if I pluck an eyebrow hair and it's really, really small and you grab it, you can make all the DNA samples you need or is that kind of fiction or, or what? Potentially. Um, what we do, we would need the root, so your hair would have to have a root. Um, without the root, it would require another type of testing, but still possible. Um, but what we do when we, when we make copies of DNA is we don't copy all of the DNA. Forensically, I'm not interested in how we're all the same. Over 99% of our DNA is going to be the same because we're all human. We look at that less than 1% that varies from person to person. We look at regions that vary, and because of those variations, we can compare, like I said, your known DNA to the, to the blood stain from the crime scene and, and do a comparison and say, uh, is, it, is it similar or not, um, and very easily exclude you. Um, but again, if, this, if the information is the same, I would then use statistics to, to give meaning to that match. Well, Robin, what's the average turnaround time? You get a sample, I, I, everybody, pretty much, with the exception of maybe a few who don't watch TV, have seen CSI. They've right. seen most of these crime shows. And you'll see the detectives or the, the forensic people on that show, they'll go out, they'll get a, a scene, a, a sample from the scene, they'll bring it right back to the lab, and five seconds later, they bring up on their flat screens, oh, this is a suspect. I mean, that's not really the way it goes. What, what, what's the realistic timetable? What happens when a sample comes in? And what's the turnaround time? Yes, admittedly, we do not do testing within one hour. Um, <laughs> it's it, not like getting photos at Walgreens? Right, right. Um, so we have a process in place. We have a lean process um, to make us more efficient. And when a case gets started, it's about a two-week turnaround time. Um, but if I were to take a sample start to finish, it could be a, a, few, hour, a few days excuse me, to get a, a DNA profile. Um, but for efficiency's sake, we, we've created this process that once we start a test, it's about two-week turnaround time. Okay. And, and that's pretty fast. I mean, that, that, that is fast industry-wise, correct? I would say so. I, I, our goal is to get to from the time uh, evidence is received to a report is issued to about 30 days. Um, so that, that's what we're shooting for. Now, Robin, I was fascinated because one of the big things that the Forensic Science Center is doing is they're going back and they're testing all of the old rape kits, or a, as you call them, the sexual assault kits. Uh, and there's a backlog in Harris County of over 6,600 of these. I, I think that uh, Harris County led the nation in the backlog or was or very not high even, up there. Not even close. Really? Yeah. It, it led close. Texas for sure. Right. Houston, uh, I, I, believe, I believe there was, the, the second in Texas was, was Dallas at about 4,000. Am I right on that? About, and, yes. And so your initiative has, has been to go back and test those. Uh, and, and, and I want you to talk a little bit about that because as I understand it, you formed a task force. If, if you can shed some light on that and tell us a, about what's going on with these kits. Sure. Um, the Houston Police Department, uh, when we were with the Houston Police Department, we had an opportunity to participate in a sexual assault kit um, task force. It is action research based, um, and what that means is we invited the stakeholders to the crime of sexual assault. So not, it's not just a lab problem, it's not just an investigator problem. We invited um, folks from the DA's office, uh, sexual assault nurse examiners, who are the nurses who actually collect this evidence. Um, we've, we have um, brought on the um, Excuse me, I don't want to forget anybody. Um, researchers from Sam Houston State, so criminal justice researchers, uh, as well as domestic violence experts from the University of Texas. Um, and so the idea is to bring all these folks together who are a part of the process and to discuss the process, try to, to, to figure out what are the problems and come up with solutions and then make suggestions and implement them and then reassess, are these solutions working? And the biggest goal, in addition to testing, and of course testing is key, um, is to improve the response to sexual assault, to engage the victim longer. And as a result, many changes have been made in it, not only in the laboratory, in which kits are test, or automatically brought over for testing, so we don't have this backlog of or these untested 6,663 cases. Um, also, with investigations, ways to engage the, the complainant or victim longer in the process. Um, and so it, it's been a really great opportunity to be a part of, and, and the idea is to come up with solutions that can be um, used in other jurisdictions nationwide. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, Robin, I had a question. It's really for you, Robin, and Scott. What was the reason for the backlog? I mean, what, what do you reason why there was well, a and, backlog and, of that many cases? Right, and you use the, the term backlog. And it really, when you say backlog, people think of stacks and stacks of stuff waiting to be tested that couldn't get in. These are actually 6,600 cases or kits that sat in the property room because an investigator had not chosen to submit them to the lab to be analyzed. Now, why would an investigator do that? Well, if you have a sexual assault, 
and the the question at hand is not identity but consent there may have been a rape kit um, collected but at that point the investigator says all we're arguing we're not arguing about who it is we're just arguing about the circumstances of it so why would we test that kit if um, if the uh, defendant pled out pled out the case is done why test the kit um, well there are arguments on the other side of that and the arguments some of those arguments are uh, uh, well, maybe that, uh, that uh, uh, defendant pled out because the defendant knew that he had unidentified DNA in the national database and he didn't want his name attached to it. So he figured if he pled out, he could avoid getting that, uh, getting that, that swab done that would attach his name to it. The other issue that, that Robin's talking about with the task force is a lot of times the victims just say, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm not going to stay around. I'm not going to, going to make this case. I'm not going to be there. In that case, again, given all of the pressures on investigators, it's okay. We're not going to pursue this any further. One of the reasons that Houston had a large number of these kits is that despite all of those things, they never disposed of the kits. Some of these go back to before when DNA was analyzed, when, when the only use of it was to look for uh, a blood type or a hair sample or something like that. Uh, Houston kept all these kits, and so it presented an opportunity to go through and find out if there really was any probative evidence there, and, and that's the process that we've gone through. Um, the mayor uh, strongly supported testing all of the kits and not trying to make another distinction of we're going to do these, we're not going to do those. Uh, and, uh, and so we found two outside commercial firms, because it was so much bigger a job than the lab would typically handle. Uh, to do these over a period of a year, they've about completed their work, and the investigators at HPD are now working on, on putting those pieces together with those open investigations. Excellent. We're talking tonight with Scott Hotchberg and Robin Guidry of the Houston Forensic Science Center. We're going to open up the phone lines now and start taking your calls, so please call us at 713-807-1794. Also, tweet us your questions at HCCLA underscore TV. One of the first questions coming in on Twitter uh, wants to know, have you guys caught up with the backlog yet? I, I, I don't think that's really, you guys have been, in, you're in your infancy now. I, I would imagine you're far from catching up with it. But how far are, along are you? Well, the, the, if you're talking about those 6,600 kits, those were outsourced about a year ago under HPD's mm -hmm. uh, administration. Um, they have almost all been tested. Mm. There are a few that require some extra information. That is, I think it's in the neighborhood of a couple hundred at this Even point. Even less than that. Even less than that. The next thing that happens is that personnel in the lab review all of those test results to make sure that they, that they appear to be technically accurate. And then they go over to the investigators. And so where we are now, if I remember the numbers, um, we've got a couple of thousand left to do final technical review on. Um, and HPD has actually brought in uh, retired investigators to help work that, that huge number. And, and we don't have, I don't have those numbers of, of, of in fact, we're going to get a report on that at our next board meeting. But uh, again, since we're the lab, we do the scientific work and then hand it back to the investigators to do. On other areas, um, uh, what we're trying to do is get to a goal of, of, of about a 30-day turnaround at maximum on anything. And, and we're a ways from that yet. We've got, we've got some work to do in some areas uh, more than others. I think the lab is more caught up than some of the other areas are. Um, but uh, that involves recruiting personnel. And one thing we're trying to do from a quality standpoint is bring in people who, have, who already know their job, and bring in experienced talent, rather than bringing in people and, and, and starting from scratch to train them. So we've been, we've been recruiting nationally. If you, if you know some good forensic scientists <laughs> in a variety of, of different areas, um, we'll be happy to take their resumes. And, and Scott and Robin, we actually have another question coming in via Twitter, and it is pretty much, what is the protocol if errors do occur? So if there's an error in the lab, for whatever reason, uh, what, what protocols are in place to address that error, and are the defense side 
notified of that error. So, you know, and I'm sure the state is, but is the defense also notified of that, of that error? So, oh, that's a very good question. So, with DNA testing, there are so many controls in place that before we issue the results, we actually look for for problems. We look for contamination, and so um, that we would not issue results if there was any concern about the quality of the data. Um, we have a policy, as does every other DNA lab in the country, that when you have a concern of contamination, you you would retest the sample. So both parties would know because the sample was tested multiple times that um, that there may have been a problem with testing. But what what accredited laboratories have in place are. Um, when, when there's an issue in the laboratory, we have to perform what's called a root cause analysis. It's very important that we try to figure out how did this happen, why did this happen, and what can we do to prevent it from happening again. Um, you know, when there is an error, um, we have to retest. That's, a, that's more time and resources, and you know, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of casework. There's a lot of work for us to do. And so it's in our interest to minimize and you know, eliminate as much as possible any avoidable er errors. And so he mentioned earlier the quality system. I mean, that's a big part of when, when we do have an issue um, with the quality of the data. We do that root cause analysis and try to determine, you know, what do we do to keep this from happening again? One of the big things I, I think everybody wants to know, Scott, is you talk about independence, you talk about transparency, but one of the big factors out there is money and the funding for this. And we can talk about being independent and being transparent all day long, but the fact of the matter is, there's somebody who has a purse string on this. That's right. Where's the money coming from? Well, the money comes from your tax dollars and from the city. Um, I think there's, there's pretty good agreement that the lab uh, and the forensic, the entire forensic center um, has been underfunded for a long time. Um, that's not unusual with forensic centers. I mean, if you look in a police department, the, uh, the sexy thing to spend money on is, is boots on the ground. Everybody wants more police officers in their neighborhood. It's very hard as one tiny corner, and we're about a $20 million operation on a, an HPD budget that's, that's what, about three quarters of a billion or something like that. I, I'm, I may not have that number correct, but it's, we're, the number I do know is we're about a $20 million operation. So um, it's, it's easy to get lost in that. Um, Do you get one all of your the, funding from the city? One, uh, at, at the moment, we get all of our funding from the city. Okay. We are, uh, at, but I was going to say, one of the things that having an independent board does, it, it gives us nine advocates with the mayor and city council. Um, and that's separate from the police department. It's no longer an allocation within the police department budget. It's a standalone operation. And we can come in with the specific needs that we have, and we're not going through the chief. We're going directly to the people that are controlling those purse strings. Uh, right now, we're uh, almost entirely funded by the city. What we're looking to do as, as, um, as we demonstrate our ability to handle, uh, handle the work is to contract with other local police departments, law enforcement agencies, and, and pick up some of their work. We're in discussions with, uh, with Pasadena right now. Um, that's public information. Um, they run a, a small, uh, what I hear to be an excellent lab, but it's a small lab. And it's not very efficient to run a lab that's that small. So we may be bringing them on as part of our funding stream and doing their work and incorporating them into, into what we do. Scott, are any of your services available to the private bar? And not just defense side. I mean, are, are your services available, period, to the private sector? Or are you limited in scope to, to government entities? Right, not currently. Um, and we have uh, in the DNA area, which is the area we've talked about a lot today, we have some very strict requirements that the federal government sets as to who we can perform services for and still have access to the CODIS database. The CODIS database is the national database of DNA. Uh, we have to have that to do our work. Um, in the view of, of the board, unfortunately, we cannot get access to the CODIS database um, if we provide services directly for even the defense bar. And so that's why you've got to go to a judge or go to the DA and get permission to ask for something to have a DNA test run is because under the federal agreement that, that is the standard federal agreement for CODIS access, we can't, you're not considered part of the criminal justice system, um, which is, was amazing to us. Uh, in other areas we're act in, where we don't have that restriction, and, and we, were, we were very careful and adamant to make sure that when our contract with them was written, we limited that restriction to just what they had the legal authority to limit it to. Uh, in other areas, we're looking for business.
And so, you know, if we can provide those services, I think we'd be, we, uh, Dr. Garner would be happy to talk to people about doing it. I don't see us getting at the moment into, into civil work. Um, we clearly can't do paternity testing or anything like that. Uh, but we're looking for opportunities to make better use of the equipment and facilities and expertise that this lab has because that provides better value for the taxpayer. We have a couple more questions coming in on Twitter. Um, one says, what are common causes of errors or contamination during analysis or in results? Well, the, the technology I referred to earlier where we can get information from very small samples, um, the downside to that, the, the increased sensitivity, the downside of that is potential for contamination. And so, um, like I said, we do wear face masks and gloves and gowns and, you know, um, we, we, we handle one sample at a time. Anything we can do to prevent cross-contamination is something that we routinely do. Uh, we also have a DNA database of the staff so that when we have unknown DNA profile, we can look at the database and ensure that this DNA profile came from the sample and not from somebody in the laboratory who maybe accidentally sneezed and, and, or you know, somehow contributed their DNA. Um, you know, in other DNA laboratories that deal with plant or, or other types of DNA, they don't have those concerns of human contamination, but because we're dealing with human DNA, it's a big concern. But again, we have so many um, measures in place to prevent it from occurring. You know, there are, there are errors that can get into the system that aren't scientific errors. I mean, you start with, with uh, somebody collects, a, a, let's say, a, a toxicology sample. Somebody collects a, a blood sample. Um, do they put the right person's name on the sample? That's something that's external to the lab entirely. And we could go through and measure it and come out with the results. Uh, there are a lot of human factors in this, which is why we're look, we're, we continue to look to build in checks and more checks and sort of stop the presses whenever there's any question. And we've made improvements in that regard um, even since our board took over the operation in April. Just better ways to do things um, that, that are aimed at, at preventing any of those errors from getting through. One of our viewers wants to know, uh, circling back to some comments you made earlier about statistical profiles, uh, and they want to know, is that still leaving room for some bias and some corruption in the system? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, what's important for us is um, when I have a DNA profile from an evidence sample that matches a person, a, a known source of DNA, it's important for me to know is does it match because it's a very rare profile and that no one else on the planet has it or does it match because um, the information is very common and everybody has it and so the reason we provide those statistics is it's not a it's not a certainty of the, the quality of the results. It's giving weight to the jury, to, to the judge, to, to all the parties. Um, how likely is it that this DNA profile came from the individual I've compared it to versus some other random person on the earth? So we provide statistics like one in 600 quadrillion. What that means is you'd have to go through 600 quadrillion people before you'd likely to find someone else with that exact same DNA profile. So the likelihood of it being from someone other than that individual is really, really small. Um, if my statistics are uh, one in a hundred, that's very weak data. That means a lot of people could have also contributed that DNA information. And so it's important that we give the juries and the other users of our information uh, a meaning to that match. How, how significant is that information? And Robin, to kind of add to this question, uh, how subjective of it is it, that testing process with the technician to say, okay, this is now the one in four quadrillion versus the one in 100? I mean, is that computer driven like the, 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 or, or, or science driven or is it in any way, shape, form uh, subjective to the, the, tech, to the tech doing the work? No, it's not subjective at all. Um, so DNA analysts are trained to compare the data, do the interpretation and say, is this consistent or not? Um, we then do the statistics. It uses the FBI's um, database for um, frequencies. These have been collected in the United States. It's across different races. And the idea is to, again, um, how meaningful is this conclusion I'm giving you? I'm giving you some weight, some significance to it, versus me just saying, yep, it's the same DNA profile. Um, what, what would a juror, how would they distinguish between the really partial data that is not very meaningful versus the really um, strong quality data that is very um, significant. We want to give people the ability to make that distinction. Um, we are not allowed to give an inclusion without backing it up with statistics. It's very easy to exclude somebody. If it doesn't match, it doesn't match. But if it includes somebody, well, does it include you? Um, uh, and as we, as we build larger and larger databases, 
the possibility of it matching to somebody who had nothing to do with the, with the crime that's being investigated becomes greater. And that information has to be divulged to the juries and it has to be explained in a way that uh, helps them understand what reasonable doubt is versus erasing any doubt, which is, of course, the, the issue that you deal with on a regular basis. I, I want to circle back to the funding issue. And I, I want to ask you, Robin, because you're in the lab every day. You're, you're kind of the boots on the ground, if you will, for, for the lab itself. Do you find that the funding is adequate and that you have the resources that you need to get the job done? I do. Within the time I've been here, within six years, we've more than doubled in, in size and staff. Uh, so right now, my forensic biology unit, there are 34 of us. Uh, when I started in 2008, um, I believe there are about 13 or 14 folks. So we, we're, we're given, we are being given the resources. We are very fortunate to also have a lot of grant funding from the National Institute of Justice. And that allows us to purchase equipment. Um, DNA equipment is very expensive. Um, it allows us to purchase equipment and new chemistries and technologies and bring them online sooner than perhaps we would otherwise. Um, but there's definitely a support for, a clear support for management of, of giving us the resources that we need to get the job done. One of, the, one of the, the, the serious issues that I think we have is just an issue of space. And of course, space costs money. But if you look at the amount of space we have for the number of technicians we have, for the number of staff we have, uh, it is so far below uh, sort of national standard levels. Um, and it's also configured in a manner, I mean, HPD is in an old office building. It's in the old Houston Natural Gas Building. When that became unviable as a commercial building, it became HPD headquarters. It was never designed as uh, a police building, much less a lab building. So um, uh, I'm hopeful and I expect that there'll be new facilities in our future. Uh, we're in the process of, of doing some needs assessments to figure out what those need to look like and trying to build something that will take care of the needs of the city of Houston and, and other, uh, other uh, uh, areas in the region over, say, the next 10 to 20 years and try to build for the future so that we're always able to maintain that capacity. Uh, the other area that, that I don't think has gotten enough attention over the years is just regular equipment replacement. As Robin mentioned, we get a lot of grant-funded equipment, and that's great, but it's not something you can rely on to make sure that then when that particular piece of DNA analysis equipment uh, is due to be retired, that it can be retired. So how much time do you spend trying to, to coax it to, to, to last another year and still stay in compliance, and at what point would you be better off going out and, and, and buying new? And so uh, one of the things we've established is, a, is an actual predictive replacement cycle so we know from year to year to year what we're going to need and can build that into the budget in the front end rather than trying to patch it from the back side. Well, and along those lines, you said your budget currently is about $20 million a year. Give or take, yeah. This is the fastest growing major city in the country. It's not going to get any smaller. And the, the number of cases are only going to increase. The number of DNA kits that need to be analyzed and processed is only going to increase. Have you guys made any projections as to what the, the realistic budgetary needs are going to be? No, that's part of the needs analysis that we're trying to do is, is figure out where we're going to be. And it's, it's something, frankly, that, that uh, nobody at HPD has, has really done. You know, there's there's... There's an impact that's beyond just the growth in population. As we get backlog times down and turnaround times down in all of the different sections uh, within the forensic center, uh, does that encourage investigators to send us more stuff? Does that encourage the, the officer on the street to say, well, I wasn't going to get that fingerprint if it was going to take three months to get back, but if I can get it back in 30 days, heck, let's go ahead and get that. And making those projections are, are, are difficult. Um, I, you know, I don't think... I don't want to get out of here without giving folks an idea of just the volume that this organization processes. I mean, in a, in a typical year, more than 10,000 controlled substance analyses. Those aren't things where you're trying to figure out who the person is. You're just trying to determine, is this the stuff? Uh, you're doing about, uh, what, 3,600 uh, DNA tests in a year. Um, we've got 4,000 fingerprint exams. I'm just huge numbers. And, and, and so as we look down the pipeline and, and hear people over at HPD saying, well, you know, if you could do this for us, we'd love to give you this much more stuff. We got to try to put that all in a bucket and, and go back to the, to the leaders of the city and say to do this right and to really have an impact and to have the information available in a timely manner and accurately, this is what we're going to need. We've, we've got a call coming in, guys. I want to I get to our caller. Uh, hello. Welcome to Reasonable Doubt. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, I don't think, uh, we're not getting the audio on that, so. Uh, Scott, uh, while we wait for the caller, I have a question for you, and actually, Robin, you can answer it, too. You've mentioned a couple times about the national database. I mean, CODIS is what you call it. Uh, what, is, what is CODIS? Who maintains the database? And what, what, what is included in it and what is not included in the CODIS database? Um, so CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Index System. Uh, and like Scott mentioned earlier, it's the National DNA Database. Every laboratory in the United States, every forensic laboratory, looks at the same information, the same DNA. And because of that, we're able to compare data from lab to lab, and we're able to have this national database. And so the utility for us is we can put evidence from a crime scene into the database and potentially get hits against other cases that are already in the database or to a convicted offender who may have been convicted of a crime that would require his DNA to be collected and submitted to the database system. So it's a tremendous tool for investigators to help solve crimes. Um, it must be evidence associated with a crime, though. Um, so, and this is not decided, you know, the laboratory doesn't decide what goes in. It's very much dictated by FBI rules. You asked who, who manages it. Um, CODIS is run by the FBI. And the combined DNA index system refers to the various levels of the database. So we have at my laboratory what's called a local DNA index system. There's a state level, so that's all of Texas. Every state has their own. And then the national. So sometimes uh, a sample might not be sufficient in terms of quality to go all the way national. It might just go to the state level. Maybe it's partial DNA profile. And what that would mean is that it would only be compared against other profiles in the Texas database. Um, the more data we are able to yield from a sample, the more likely it will be to go to the national level, in which case we can get hits to somebody in Illinois or in California or, or Arkansas. We've got a really great question on Twitter that I want to go to, Robin, because one of the things you talked about earlier, Scott, was the, the amount of controlled substances that, that the lab is analyzing and having to get, that, get out the door. The, the question coming in is what percentage of your time is spent on testing for marijuana? Is it a waste of time uh, given that so many states are becoming or are making marijuana legal? And I, I think that's a fair question to ask because there is some debate. Oregon just became the third state uh, to legalize marijuana. There's debate within Harris County here about what the DA is going to do with regard to you know, a pretrial diversion system. So how much of your time is spent analyzing marijuana samples that come in? Do you know the I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the percentage of that, but I'll, but I will also say that that it's not in our purview to make that decision. Sure. I mean, obviously, we test what's sent to us, and we provide reliable information on what that is. Um, if I was still wearing my legislative hat, uh, I might have another take on this. But as the as the director of the uh, of the Houston Forensic Science Center. Uh, those decisions are out of our hands. But is it something that you as the chairman could, Scott, go to the mayor and say, and, and, and say, look, we're spending X amount of dollars just testing weed, uh, you know, I, I and think, try to get a... I think, if the inf I think if the question were asked, we could come up with the answer to that. Okay. Um, one of the things that's, that's, that was interesting to me coming from a business background and, and uh, uh, working in government for a while is that uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a very deep stack of metrics yet on what the lab actually does. I mean, I gave you some general figures, but in terms of breaking it down to how much time is being spent on this versus that versus the other, um, I'm not sure we have that information yet. It's one of the things we're working to develop, and we put in a whole cost accounting system to try to figure that out. But if somebody wanted to know that information, we could find it out for them. We, uh, one of our, our best Twitter followers is, is at Midnight Slice. They have a watch party uh, that watches our show. <laughs> and so we're very thankful to them for organizing the watch party. And, and they have a really good question. I think it should be directed at you, Robin. Okay. Uh, they want to know, what's the weirdest thing you've ever tested in the lab? Ooh, I, I don't know. Um, can you mention it on air? If you can imagine it, we've probably tested it. Um, you know, anything that would content, potentially contain biological material. Um, uh, I, I've, I've tested feces, um, I've tested um, yeah, sex toys, um, so if you can imagine it, we've probably seen it in the laboratory. <laughs> to, to follow that question, have you ever got something to test and looked at it and, and said, what is this? Like before you can even test it, you looked at it and you just didn't know what you were looking at to even begin 
the procedure. I mean, is that, is that common or not common? Or? I, I wouldn't say that that happens too often. A lot of the samples we get are swabs from crime scenes. You know, we have CSU agents that can go out into the scene and they collect evidence. Uh, if it's small enough, they'll actually submit the item, and that way we can swab it within, within the controlled environment of the laboratory. Um, but most of the samples we get are swabs that are collected by our CSU personnel. We're going to try again with the phones. Uh, Caller, are you there? I, I am here. Can you hear me? We can. Welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My question is, is for the, the chairman. Where, where do you see the lab going in the future, and, and what are your plans to uh, to make the lab better and grow? Uh, and that, and that's all. Well, um, uh, you know, I, th I think I think we've talked about some of the some of the growth issues and how we respond to the growth and how we're able to do that in an efficient manner is, is important. I think there are a couple of areas where we're looking for expansion um, in areas that the lab doesn't currently perform services, which means that, that if anybody in the criminal justice system wants that information, they've got to go to DPS and, and wait a significant amount of time or find somebody else to do it. Uh, two of those areas that have been identified are, are trace evidence, which my understanding, uh, and Robin may correct me on this, is sort of everything that doesn't fit into one of the other categories. Um, uh, you know, a piece of glass, uh, uh, sort of the stuff that seems to be magic on CSI but is, is really difficult. Uh, we don't have a, a capability to do that analysis, and we need to, to, to create a full picture of what, uh, of what the evidence is for a case. The other is, is an area called question documents, where you're just doing document analysis and trying to see what you're learning from that. Um, that we are expecting a significant amount of growth in the analysis of cell phone data and computer data, which is, which is something that I think we've only really scratched, us, scratched the surface of and expect to grow significantly. Um, uh, but from the other standpoint, our, our additional budget requests this year have also included additional quality control people uh, and additional management staff to handle, to make sure that that those functions are built into the operation rather than somebody having to interrupt their job to go take care of a, of a problem. Uh, I think the thing that I'm most concerned about coming from, from uh, at one point, a small business manufacturing environment is if you don't have somebody whose job it is to take care of the, the exception, then you're always interrupting the process and you're always creating more problems. So we're trying to build that out and make that a lot more robust. Uh, Scott, just briefly, what what all, just, if you can just tell, give us a bullet point of what uh, your lab covers, what do you test for? Controlled substances, blood and breath alcohol tests, DNA samples, firearm examinations, um, fingerprint exams, audiovisual, all the, 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 the viewing and enhancement of all those camera tapes that you see around, uh, digital media, uh, and the crime scene unit. And did I forget anybody? Please tell me I didn't. You got them all. Okay. <laughs> one, one of the final things I want to ask you guys is there is a portal that has been created, as I understand it, that the DA's office can access uh, the results from these tests. But the defense bar can't. Uh, is that something that is going to be changed? Is that something that, as we talked about earlier with CODIS, we have to go and, and get a court order? or um, get permission from the DA. Is there any plans in the works for this portal to become accessible to defense lawyers? You know, we've talked about that in generalities. Part of the problem, again, is we don't know who you are. You know, until a case, unt until we get made aware that a case is going to court, which we don't know initially, um, uh, we don't even know if there's a defense lawyer involved, and then we don't know who that defense lawyer is. So I think it's something that our board would be open to doing, but what we're going to have to figure out is how do we know that you're the defense lawyer on this particular case? How do we authenticate that? How do we make sure that you're only getting information that you're authorized to get? And I hate, you know, hate to make it sound more difficult than it might be, but it reminds me of, of HIPAA sort of requirements where now you, you, know, you can't get information about somebody else's uh, health records unless there's very clear authority that that you have that. But I think it'd be something that, and, and Carmen and I have talked about it on a couple of occasions, that, uh, that we can work together on. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest reasons to, for the DA portal is not just for the DA, but to make it a whole lot easier for the lab to deliver information. And and I, we just set it out there yeah. instead of and having I, to respond personally to a request. I hate to cut you they off, just Scott, go to but it. that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank and you. I appreciate both Scott Hotchberg and Robin Guidry being with us to discuss the Houston Forensic Science Center. Uh, we appreciate their time. We appreciate their insight. 
As always, uh, you can find us on the web, Facebook, HCCLA Reasonable Doubt, or on Twitter, at HCCLA.com. Like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter. I'm Jimmy Ard1 for Damon Parrish. We will see you next week on HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. Have a good one. We're probably still in the air right now. Don't worry about it. You guys. It's good. It actually went faster than I thought it was. Like, really? Really? It went fast. <laughs>